Hi there. Can you hear me? Is that good? Might as well get started. Um, my name is John Poach. I'm a professor of English here at Texas Tech. I teach creative writing uh, and poetry classes. And uh, I publish some books. Buy them, please. Uh, you can find them easily. Um, you can find some of my poems online if you're interested. Um, today, uh, I'll let Chad Abushanab, my partner here, uh, introduce himself after I'm done. Uh, Diane Warner was going to be on this panel, but as you know, many of you know, she got called out of town. Um, and so uh, it'll just be us two today. We might finish a little bit early. Uh, there'll definitely be time for um, questions afterwards, commentary, screaming, criticism, whichever. Um, so uh, I'll get started. We're going to talk about uh, poetry that has to do with shapeliness in combination with uh, nature today. And so I've been working for the past two years on a scholarly article on George Herbert's Easter Wings. Wrong way. There we go. Uh, many of you have seen this poem before. It is m probably the most famous shape poem of all time. And uh, I found out some very interesting things uh, about this poem, and I'm going to discuss them with you. And then I'll move into a discussion of, uh, I'll read a few of my own poems and talk about how I'm trying to do some interesting things with shape as well. Um, in light of Herbert's major accomplishment with this poem. Um, let me read this poem for you, Easter Wings. Lord, who created man in wealth and store, though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more till he became most poor, with thee, O oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day thy victories. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. My tender age and sorrow did begin, and still with sickness and shame, thou didst so punish sin that I became most thin. With thee, let me combine and feel thy victory. For if I imp my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. Now, um, when I started looking at this poem, there's, an ob there's some obvious things going on. You can see that uh, this poem, uh, Herbert was a devotional poet. He wrote poems uh, almost strictly about his uh, Christian beliefs. And uh, you can see as this poem becomes uh, thinner in the middle uh, that uh, the subject matter of the poem uh, becomes most poor, right? And then you could see with the expansion back out uh, a case of, oh, let me rise, um, and this movement back outwards. Same thing in the second stanza, um, becoming, again, uh, most thin, and then um, the poem, combine, let me combine, that word kind of begins the expansion back outward again. There's a lot more going on in this. I, I mean, you can look at the first line, and the, the, the discussion of uh, wealth and store being one of the longest lines in the poem, right? Um, there we begin. Um, my article's a 23-page article, um, and so I just wanted to talk about just a few things um, that are going on in this poem, especially to do with, um, with the look of this thing. Here's the first uh, printing of the poem. Uh, this was published in the Little Getting Workshop um, shortly after Herbert's death. So Herbert never got to see this um, poem in print, uh, or any of his poems in print. You could see how the poem is turned on its side. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, and you see this shape that it has, the wings kind of extending out this way, right? Um, 
I think it would. I think George Ferrer, who is the head of the Getting Workshop, um, was trying to emphasize this shapeliness in uh, by turning it on its side to show you these wings spread outward like this, uh, because as we saw in the previous slide, let me go back. Um, it's a different shape, obviously, right? Um, if it's not on its side. Now, one thing that um, I discovered, uh, I thought, well, I'm writing this essay. I'm writing an entire book of um, essays about poems of deep spiritual belief. And this was one that I wanted to write about. I stumbled upon this thing uh, because I thought, well, I want to look at Herbert's manuscript versions of this to see if there's any kind of difference between um, the way it was printed. And sure enough, I found something absolutely radical. These are two of the manuscript versions. The one on the right is the one that was prepared for the printing of the first version. So that, that one on the right is the posthumous version. Herbert never saw this one. Uh, some secretary or copyist would have written that down. The one on the left was also done by a secretary, but the MND, we can tell this is not Herbert's handwriting because they matched it up with other letters that we do have of Herbert's, but we see his handwriting in the emendations. So he actually saw this version on the left, and that's important to think about because in some way that gives us a kind of proof that this shapeliness of this uh, manuscript was important. Okay, um, One thing that you'll notice that I think is a radical difference between um, the presentation in print versus uh, the way Herbert originally had this poem drafted is that it is not centered. You know, let me go back to, or just one, and you can see this is pretty much centered, right? Here, you can see that the poem is right justified. Um, we don't know why this is. I have some theories that I'm going to talk about just briefly. Uh, there, he, this is a poem by Simeus of Rhodes. He's a Greek poet. Um, wrote hundreds and hundreds of years before um, before Herbert, and Herbert would have had access to Simeus's poems. This was a this poem in this version right here was probably I th think it was printed in the late 15th century. I think is. If I'm remembering correctly, I think it's 1591. So Herbert would have had access to this book. It's in several libraries um, in England around where Herbert lived. And so uh, this poem is actually called Wings. And so uh, you can see that there's an affinity between the first print version and this. Um, my own personal idea is that um, Herbert was riffing on this poem um, Ferrer knew about it and so printed it to look very much li like the Simeus poem. But you can see in Herbert's handwriting that the po you know, if we go back one, uh, that it's not this shape at all. It's right justified, right? Uh, another interesting thing about Simeus is that he also has a poem called The Altar. George Herbert's other famous shape poem is called The Altar. So there's, we're, you can pretty much be 100% sure that Herbert knew of Simeus's work. We don't have it that documented in any of Herbert's writings, but it seems apparent. Okay. This is how I think the poem probably should have looked when it was first printed. Uh, and uh, I'm skipping over so much stuff that is involved in this poem. Um, I just don't have time to cover it today. Um, but you can look for my article. It's coming out in Christianity and Literature probably in the fall, which I'm really excited about because I've never written a scholarly article. I'm normally the poet who just kind of writes his own poems. Um, but I think this is a big kind of groundbreaking essay uh, because nobody has written about the right justification of this poem. I looked everywhere. I thought, surely somebody's written about this. Surely. And um, even the, um, a scholar who is most known for his writings about Herbert, a guy named um, 
uh, Randall McLeod, he also go, he, he's a strange cat. Uh, he publishes under the name Random Cloud uh, and 20 other names that sound somewhat like this and all these different spellings of Randall McLeod. Um, he's a wild man of Renaissance literature. He wrote a 112 page essay on Easter wings, but it's really all about the first print versions um, all the way up to present, actually. Uh, but he never talks about it except in passing about that the handwritten version is right justified, which is completely shocking to me because he covers every aspect of the printed, of the printed versions of it and in m the most bizarre ways, but the guy is a genius. But it seems to me he's not engaging with this thing that, that I'm interested in. Now, um, I'll just say this one thing and I'll get up to show you. Um, that I think this is the wing right here, is this negative space. Um, and it's not the shape of the text, but it's actually the shape um, of the absence of the text. And there are several kind of logical reasons for this uh, to be, because he's writing about clearly Easter, the risen Christ. And if you're the subject matter of that, uh, we know um, in the Christian religion that the proof of the risen Christ, of the resurrection, is the absent body right at the tomb. And so the absence as presence um, is a huge theme for any Christian believer. Um, as well, you could almost imagine the stone being rolled away, uh, the kind of shapeliness of that. So. For me, mind blown. Um, if we see this as the shape of this poem rather than that kind of butterfly, that kind of, that, er, that other shape um, that I'll go back to that original shape. Um, oftentimes this is seen as an X, which is a sign of the cross, right, the chiasmus. Um, also it's seen as an hourglass that is kind of where sand is poured out, so it's about death and the fact that we're all going to die, but we need resurrection life. Um, and there's one other shape. Oh, the, the cross, the idea of the cross um, is, figures in this. But um, OK. So this is my poem. And let me look where we are on time to make sure that I'm OK. Yeah, we're doing all right. I wrote uh, the first half of this poem uh, the moon uh, last year, not really intending to, I guess, do, I guess it was just subconsciously in my mind of kind of playing with what Herbert was doing. Um, and it was quickly picked up by the new criterion was published. Um, and then it occurred to me that I needed to write the sun poem um, to kind of fill out the circle in between. Um, which was much, much harder to write after I had that first half already done. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not even sure if, the, if this works or not, but um, I do like the moon poem. Um, so I'll read these for you. The moon. On a calm river, only a temporary architect of water, old, exiled from some cold nation, in white gown, gothic, she draws with her knife the slowest sparks of herself toward an imagined fire, hardly believing in failure, failing. Apt tomb, haunted by wasps, last year's wasp nest, this old skull of an owl is a bleak future, delicate, a mere meaninglessness, ness of last month's newspapers. The sun. The father's boy, his lightest horses, hydrogen and helium, white as day, invisible ink drawn in a circle of rain slashing at heavens. How you hate the winter and the blurs of wax, and yet you wax, high over all, full circle, chlorophyll, praises from leaves lifting blossom song to the white gold in the eye of a hawk watching all this god of honey suspended in air dripped from some heavenly comb. Uh, this is a sonnet, and this is a different kind of shapeliness. 
I write a lot of sonnets. Pecos at Holy Ghost Creek. State Road 63 tends to chase the river the way a sinner's turpitude turns back for his redemption upstream toward the mountain source where this anointing weighs into the murky Pecos brown trout worry with their 60 spots of fire in the stillnesses beside the currents. We crave the wilderness beneath each flat black beside the hurry. Below my line tri trout long in the sunshine of dreams. The spirit makes these flames almost real when this vision wakes within my wrist. In the white way falling through a blue place, the sign points travelers to cowls or holy ghost. Which direction do you think I fished? Um, I'll just say, uh, you know, I, I gave a talk earlier this semester about the sonnet, um, about the octave and the sestet kind of doing the work that they do, and, and the kind of the sestet being the smaller block of language that seems to outdo the earlier. And the, the shape of this um, is kind of something that uh, I'm very interested in. Uh, the geometry of how something smaller uh, can kind of can somehow outdo the larger. In this poem, I think if I'm succeeding at what I'm trying to do or what I've recognized is going on is that the first part seems to me about the metaphysical, um, uh, I'm sorry, about the, the physical aspect of this river and the way that the road and and the river kind of parallel each other as they go. Um, and then the poem kind of turning towards this idea of pursuing the Holy Ghost or the metaphysical, um, that maybe this idea of metaphysicality tends to be um, a little more substantial even, strangely enough. Okay. Uh, another river poem. I've, I'm obsessed with rivers because we don't have any rivers here. Um, I actually have an entire book of river poems coming out in the fall. Um, and this poem is kind of about a river. The last poem is about a river as road kind of paralleling each other. Here, it's the river as uh, rattlesnake and sna rattlesnake as river. Um, Cascabel uh, is a word uh, that we, um, that we uh, use for the rattlesnake. It's tail. Um, the cascabel is a pepper, right, is, is a hot pepper, but that tail of the rattlesnake can be seen as this little cascabel. And of course, you, when, when the pepper is dry, you know, you shake it and it makes that noise, right? And this poem is also um, about, very much about the border and the way the division between the United States and, uh, and Mexico and the, the people who live on both sides of it, even though they don't really make an appearance, they should be kind of ghostly around this, this poem. Cascabel of liquid days, weaving in audible Zs in your long, slow passages, where your scales weigh in the balances, the light and grays reflecting quartz and dust. How do you fuse two visions into one tongue, forked now and then, with such thirst wandering through this long brown chasm? With rain, you might wake and wash the foothills, for heaven's sake, rolling over stones, the ocotillo jealous of your distance, the roots of juniper and willow reaching to touch the ragged hem of your garment. Iridescent, as if risen, you leave behind your Holy Ghost. So again, you can see I'm obsessed with the Holy Ghost. Okay. And my last poem that I'll read, uh, Am I good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Crush Texas. Um, I'm not certain that it should be in this shape. <laughs> I, I think I'm still, I, I've got a book coming out next spring called Texas's, and this poem will definitely be in it, but I don't know if I'm going to move it back to being left justified. Um, you can see the kind of shape that I'm aiming for here is the shape of two swallows. Um, 
but maybe that's cheesy. I th the thing that we do risk oftentimes in shape poems is a kind of cheesiness. I think after Herbert's poem does so many things with that shape, um, you, you kind of owe it to yourself not to do just one thing uh, when you're making a shape poem. You have to do a multiplicity of things. Um, this is based on a, cr there's a weird epigraph that almost has, well, it has something to do with the poem, but um, it's very different than the poem. Hopefully those two things um, come up against each other in an interesting way. This is mostly from Wikipedia, this the epigraph. William George Crush conceived of a train wreck as a spectacle. No admission was charged, and train fares to the crash site were sold for $2 from any location in Texas. About 40,000 people showed up on September 15, 1896, making the new town of Crush, Texas, temporarily the second largest city in the state. Now this actually happened, this train crash was staged, um, and people came from all over the place. They didn't realize how violent it would be. Um, I think several people died. Uh, one, one of the reporters uh, there was hit by shrapnel and uh, was blinded. Um, so, people have been doing crazy shit in Texas for a, a long time. <laughs> I'm crazy stuff, I'm sorry. Um, this is being recorded. Okay. <laughs> Crush Texas. This is a love poem, by the way. <laughs> Why don't you put on that antique swallow necklace before you dress and come downstairs for breakfast? The one I got in Spain, not quite precious metal, but the deco style curves the edges and softens patinaed bronze and the swallow's restless flight on delicate porcelain, the nexus of breasts, our hearts, our corresponding sexes. The thought of that pendant makes my hands nearly reckless for balance to become the ambidextrous Beloved who loves to lose at O's and X's. Our children sleep, come down, come here. Perplex us with swallows, voracious with your reflexes, with the crush of you in the terrible state of Texas that like a staged train wreck in a good way wrecks us. Uh, and you could see, yeah. so. Everything rhymes with Texas in this poem. <laughs> so, um, okay. That's all I've got for right now. No? Okay. Uh, can you swap out your thing so I can? Yeah. Is it a scroll? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Keep an eye on the time. Hi, everybody. <laughs> 
I'm a Chad Abushanab. I am a graduate student here at Texas Tech. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in creative writing with a focus in poetry. Uh, I don't have a book to sell you, unfortunately. Um, so nothing in that department. If you want to look up some of my poems, you can uh, check me out online, uh, my website, or various places around the internet. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, when Dr. Poach approached me with this idea about the, uh, the geometry of nature, right? How, how poets measure their world or shape their world in words. Um, I didn't have like a project ongoing uh, like he did. So it was more of a, you know, what does this concept strike within me? What ideas does it lead me to? Um, and so what I'm hoping to do today is uh, I've prepared a few thoughts on geometry, nature, and poetry, this kind of interesting triad of ideas. Um, and then I will try to transition, hopefully not too awkwardly, into reading some of my own poems um, and talking a little bit about my composition process and then gradually leaving commentary behind and just getting to poetry. So, yeah, all right, sounds good. When Dr. Poach approached me with this idea of a talk and reading about the geometry of nature and how poets shape their world, my first thought was to revisit some of my favorite shapely poems, which I feel like is a really good way to put it. There is something of a stigma attached to like shape poetry or concrete poetry, you know. Um, it reminds you of stuff that you make in like third grade or whatever. Uh, but shapely poems seems to take some of the emphasis off of that as the thing that makes them go. Um, I'm talking, of course, about, you know, uh, Easter Wings by Herbert, which I'm not going to say anything more about. Obviously, John's already covered all that. Um, Bincy Poplars by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, May Swinson's Fountains of Ox, which is a really, really good one if you don't know this. Um, and perhaps my favorite of all, John Hollander's Swan and Shadow. Um, each of these poems is great in its own right. And if you don't know them, you should definitely look them up. Uh, they're fantastic pieces of poetry. Um, but they're great in their own right, and they don't need any qualification. That is to say, um, we don't have to say these are good for, like, shape poems, right? Like, that's the thing that keeps them held away from the rest of uh, their poetry family. Um, what makes these poems excellent is not that they utilize a shape not as a novelty, but as a compositional principle that affects the whole of the poem, from subject to syntax and back again. Another interesting or noteworthy similarity between these poems, or the ones that I've picked at least, is that each takes its shape from something in the natural world or some kind of natural element, the water flowing down the side of the fountains in Axe en Provence in Swinson's poem, for example. Um, in the case of Swan and Shadow, which is featured in um, John Hollander's book, Types of Shape, it's the last poem in that book. Um, it's the only one of the poems, uh, well, yeah, I think it's the only poem whose shape is not borrowed from something that was man-made to begin with, particularly symbols or objects or uh, pieces of architecture. Like I said, these poems are all mind-blowing to me, um, and much of that lies in the dynamic of their form. Uh, that is a shape taken from nature that could become the perfect vessel for a poem. But in further consideration, thinking about this, I started to wonder if, you know, poets don't already use shapes and words to find the heart of things, whether we're taking borrowed shapes or not. Um, and then my wonderment breaks back in and says, ah, but those shapes are the ones, you know, the shapes you make poetry from, the ones you call sonnet and quatrain and villanelle, those are not shapes from nature, but shapes invented by men. Anthony Hecht, whose contribution to the art of poetry can only be matched by his razor sharp prose and the nature of the art, would have us think otherwise about such forms, sonnets in particular. During a conversation with W.H. Auden, Auden suggested that certain long-lasting verse forms may achieve their timelessness through a proportional similarity with figures from the natural world. Um, Auden was perhaps just musing or making conversation. Um, he didn't really pick this up in writing anywhere else, as far as I can tell. Uh, Hecht, on the other hand, really took the idea and ran with it, um, touching on it in his essay, The Sonnet, Ruminations on Form, Sex, and History, um, and then going on into much greater detail in his book on the laws of the poetic art. In these two pieces of writing, Heck proposes that human beings are drawn to particular structures and forms. He focuses on poetry and architecture. Um, he says we are drawn to these forms because, like Auden suggested, they resemble forms we've seen in nature. The proportions of the Italian or Petrarchan sonnet, for example, with its octave and concluding sestet, eight and six, perhaps resemble the proportions of some tree trunks in their crowns of branches. Hecht also finds the 8 by 6 configuration in a number of famous architectural sites. And though I'm paraphrasing him very badly here, likens this all back to the human proportions outlined by Vitruvius. In short, 
even our traditionally received verse forms, those that aren't, you know, a swan or a fountain or a river, have some tie back to the natural world. In my own works, I often see my more formal poems having some element of nature involved. I wouldn't consider myself a nature poet, you know, by any stretch of the word, but I do visit nature in my work a lot. Coincidence, perhaps, um, but it did make me consider how I, as a poet, see nature and shape converging in my work. Um, what I want to do first is talk about composing a poem called Poem Begun in a West Texas Corn Maze. And always, I hate having to say a poem called, a poem called, or a poem begun. It's just, it, the title makes sense, though, I promise. Um, which, this poem, while it takes form in traditional rhyming quatrains of iambic pentameter, feels in the context of my talk to also be about shape um, and about how syntax along with shape can work to develop a poem. I'll read it for you now and then say a little bit about shape, subject, and syntax. Yeah, you could read that. Poem begun in a West Texas corn maze. <clears throat> I listen for children shouting through the dried up stalks, but all I hear are whispers and crows, what few remain. For over an hour, I've tried to solve the maze, navigate its rows. And now the comforting smell of funnel cake has faded. In the crisp late autumn cold, the families have started home. Their brake lights burn beyond the field. I shiver and fold my arms. A cool, translucent moon rises, and I quicken my pace to reach some final gate. Is it left or right? The sudden dark disguises the way. And I half remember another late October, when I was nine and playing here. The sun fell soft behind the stalks, and I ran further into the dark while closing time grew near. I recall it still, but no longer understand the thrill of bolting, blind and breathless, deep into the maze. I know those days have run their course, since now I cannot help but keep the end in mind, the setting of the sun the fallen ears of corn gone soft and rotten. It works against these paths and how they're crossed to spark in us again the long forgotten joy of the deliberately lost. I should say that I've been trying to write a corn maze poem for years, like literally like 10 years. Um, I tried many different formal approaches, um, including trying to write a shapely poem that took the appearance of a maze or, you know, tried to signify, 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 Signif signify, jeez, the intended <laughs> confusion. <laughs> that, that feels pretty appropriate. Signify the intended confusion, the feeling of being deliberately lost to my reader. Um, those were mostly failures, right? They were really, really bad drafts. Um, perhaps because I was trying to force shape onto content rather than let it manifest itself organically. Um, or maybe I just wasn't ready to write that poem yet. In what I hope is its final version, we have rhyming quatrains, sort of an old standby for those of us interested in rhyme and meter. One might think that such a comfortable stanza form is antithetical to the subject of being lost in a maze. But I would argue that the varying syntaxes of these lines and the heavy enjambment something that's always very deliberate to me. Um, I always hate it when it's like, I write in prose and then break it into lines. Um, creates a kind of tension with these regularized stanzas. So that while we are inevitably making our way uh, through the repeated shapes, the quatrain, we're also seeing hesitance and uncertainty with the stops and starts. Maybe I'm doing just like Frost says in The Road Not Taken and making up reasons for my choices after the fact. But I can say that I felt an actual comfort and shape of this poem as it was being written. And I could feel that being, I could feel that being palpably challenged by syntax, rhythm, and rhyme as it unfolds. I feel like it was this experience of getting lost on purpose and something familiar that led to the impulse of that final line and ultimately me feeling like I had finished the poem. Even though we all know that it's never really finished, it's just due. <clears throat> A similar feeling occurred when I was writing my poem, Girl Found Dead in the Sequatchie Valley. Um, the poem, once again, said in a familiar yet unfamiliar terrain. Is this the right one? No. Nope, wrong. There we go. That's really small. Uh, 
Sorry, this poem, once again set in a familiar yet unfamiliar terrain, finds a speaker visiting the site where a young woman's body was recovered after her murder years before. As the speaker's thoughts wander along from investigating the landscape to the murder to the reason he himself is there in the first place, we see a drifting of the, stanza, of the line arrangements inside the stanza, as well as a tension in syntax. In order to create a further sense of destabilization, I shortened each third line to trimeter, breaking the pattern of the other tetrameter lines. I'll read this one for you now. And move on to some more poems. And there's a uh, epigraph here from the Middle Tennessee Courier. Middle Tennessee Courier that I thought was really interesting. The family's victim declined to comment. Girl found dead in the Sequatchie Valley. They found her body lying here between the skeletons of pine. Like by some design, she died in fall, the time of year when shadows kissed her thin, pale wrists, and the sun at last turned white and cold, as with frozen light. The talk is vague, but most insist her boyfriend led her to the hollow at night. They had a fight, and she was newly pregnant, and he was mad, and madness is what followed. But the stories only flirt with reason, and the local papers let it go, leaving these woods to know and to forget. Now's the season when the dead wind shakes the leafless trees. The purple clover turns to brown, and all the lights in town look far away like listless eyes. And I wonder what's out here to learn besides the silence of these hills, once final sunlight fills the valley like a broken urn. It cannot hold. The light escapes as though it's liquid through a sieve, and I want to believe as all gets tangled in the drapes of night in wholeness, if not peace. The girl is dead. Her voice is lost in all the stories tossed like leaves when autumn strips the trees. What happened here, I'll never know. The valley holds such secrets dear. Her love, her blood, her fear in spring, I'll make the kudzu grow. So I have a few more poems uh, that I want to read that I feel like follow along, in, in my mind at least, with the kind of thing that I've been talking about here. Poetry, shape, nature, how these things come together in ways that aren't necessarily manifested in shapely poems, but just the fact that poetry is a shapely art in and of itself. Um, and I've been talking a lot and not really reading so much, so in the interest of uh, your time, I will strictly read poems from this point forward. This is a sonnet called uh, the, On the Dread Ranch Road Just Off 283. Not a Petrarchan sonnet, but an English sonnet. Stars are fired up like scattershot. The howls of wolves who saunter near extinction carry across the plains until they're not. All of them are headed one direction. My father was a drinker, so am I. An echo of a tune in drunken time. The bottle is an instrument, and rye, the amber music spilling over. I'm thinking about the rhythm of decline. He measured his in knuckles, hookers, drinks. I start to wonder how I'll measure mine, the ballad of the triple whiskey jinx. But the wind begins to sigh of tired things. I pull the bottle from the bag. It sings. These are all, you know, nature-y poems. And like I said, I feel like sometimes my more formal poems tend to pull me imagistically in that direction. Uh, this is called The Landlocked Lighthouse. It's written in uh, rhyming couplets. Driving at night in rain in Tennessee, I see a signal swing long above the trees. It slices sideways, turning in the night, and lends to someone somewhere sense of sight. To where it leads, I cannot hope to know, but I suspect it's where the people go who were lost despite maps and newer GPS, like mouths of no intent on saying yes. A light for drunks who stumble on the mountain, an aging poet searching for the fountain of youth, hoping it might provide the means to see what waits beyond what can't be seen. <laughs> 
and other liars might be called as well as Virgil led good Dante into hell and back again. Dark journeys such as these have often tempted me with cold unease, but I will not chase it to its woodland source. I've marked my map and shouldn't change my course, though I'll admit I find a certain charm in parking the car and putting on my warm blue coat, then drifting off into the green like a fisherman for fish he's never seen, who finds himself adrift and lost, his chart wet from the rain, the only thing apart from all the dark, the swinging of a lamp. But here there is no sea, just leaves and damp soil, musky, smelling of mushrooms and mold, like something living, fresh, but very old. And out there, calling, is the tower swinging, the light calling clearly as a siren singing. I'd like to climb those tightly spiraled stairs and find the one who tends to the affairs of wanderers turned searchers in the dark. Present my map and have him make the mark. All right, I'm gonna do one more for you. And I debated about whether or not I was gonna read this poem. I never read this when I do readings because it's like kind of dark. I'm, I'm like a horror movie freak that's like neither here nor there, but I feel like I should prime you for that before I read this poem. Um, so this poem called The Way always sort of felt like my mashup of like Southern Gothic and like EC comics, you know, where people are coming back from the grave, you know, to haunt you for your misdeeds and whatnot. Uh, it's a skeleton in a suit. It's always a skeleton in a suit, you know. The way. The day I found him doesn't stand apart from any other, save for how a rain cooled the afternoons and left the hills smelling of steam and creeping amber rosin. The days were hot, and tucked beneath the shade of spruce and pine, I followed narrow creeks until their quiet strangled ends. I searched for caves and the remains of ancient arrowheads. The woods were deep and took me far from home. The failing light softened the edges of things, and at first it seemed he might be drunk or sleeping. He slouched against a sweet gum, sweet gum trunk, and maybe, I thought, I saw him move or twitch or flinch. The sudden stench of death said otherwise. His eyes were clouded marbles shining blank, much like the sky now hidden by the trees. He sat on a blanket of ochre leaves, legs splayed out in two wide facing angles. A film of green touched his full black lips, so swollen from the humid August heat. A pistol lay malignant in his hand, and a blackened bloom of blood opened up to mark the splittered trunk behind his head. The horror was exhilarating, and yet I froze, afraid the slightest move might bring him back, might wake him from his bleeding sleep. I watched until the red sun died away and darkness dimmed that shining in his eyes. He walked into the woods to die while the sun stretched long the shadows of forest things. And when the gun went off, there was no shudder among the trees, no importance felt by the birds, just violence in the body, waiting for I, the pupil, who wanders in the woods already on a path towards knowing death. When all was hidden by loss of final light, I made my way back home. I used the bars of moon between the trees to guide my steps, pausing to listen for snapping branches behind me a voice to rattle out from the folds of dark. In dreams, I hear it, caked in blood and leaves. It sounds like rot and says, I know the way. Thank you. Any questions or? All right, suggestions for revision? <laughs> <laughs> I had a typo while I was reading. Yes. It's a different experience to me to see a poem projected while it's being read. I've never gone to reading since you've done that. Do you, have you done this at other readings yet? Mostly not. No, I've never done it. I, th I think it's quite helpful, especially if you write a kind of uh, dense 
elusive, um, you know, more fraught, you know, longer extended sentences. I'm not saying that I'm like a super smart poet. Uh, he is. Um, <laughs> but I, I would just say uh, oftentimes in reading, you know, it's different, I think, when Billy Collins reads his poems or Mary Oliver, not to denigrate them, uh, but they write a kind of clearer, uh, more direct uh, poem uh, that's more easily perceived when you hear it. Um, and while I write some of those poems, I think the poems I talked about today um, are a little bit more dense, and so kind of it's beneficial to have it um, up on the screen. I'm like gonna invest in my own AV equipment because I love this. You know, like every reading from now on, I feel like <laughs> should you know. Somebody recently had a reading that was also a wine tasting, and I was like, every reading should also be a wine tasting, <laughs> and every reading should also have a projector. I think for the poems, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, the, the wing shape is one of the only, sh I mean, I can only think of a few shapes that you could hear in that way that are also shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder how that, this, the sun and the moon is, is sort of that way, and the question of the alignment is absolutely outside of that, but I mean, it's sort of like sound vision is a big question, but especially here, where we come Um. You know, I, I was going to say something else about that Herbert poem um, that's important with the wing is that in that poem, you know, the first stanza has the, the lark in it. So he's talking about the song of the lark rising up to kind of praise God, right? And of course, he's referring, he's alluding to the poet. Uh, the second stanza doesn't really have a bird in it, but yet it does. It says, if I imp my wing on thine, that word imp is an old falconry term in which when a falcon, if it were to lose one of its, uh, one of its feathers or say a, a, some of its feathers, what they would do, and they can still do this, is that they graft wings from other birds into that empty spot to help the bird fly better again. Well, this is a picture of grafting that is very biblical. And also, uh, it's talked about throughout the New Testament that you know, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, of being grafted into the word, being grafted into God, that we, with our own limitations, and especially the poet, I think Herbert as this lark, trying to praise God, but realizing his fallibility, he can't get anywhere with an almighty God who is actually a falcon, who is there to devour him. Now, this is a picture of an almighty <laughs> Old Testament God, um, how do you approach that kind of God? Not with song, you know, but with death, by being grafted in, by having your own wings taken apart and grafted in. That's another thing to the, that poem that I think is absolutely extraordinary. And again, it's about absence as presence, right? Um, and so that's just a little bit more of what's going on there. Uh, I've been fascinated for a long time with the idea of uh, absence as presence. I wrote a big essay on Elizabeth Bishop um, in which um, it's called the, the Moose, this poem of hers, uh, which uh, the moose appears at the end and someone says it's a she. You know, and I, my claim in that poem is that the she is identified by the absence of genitalia, by the absence of big antlers, right? And so presence is absence again in that way. And ultimately I argue that Bishop is looking at this moose as her absent mother. Bishop's mother in her real life um, was put into an insane asylum and she never saw her again. And so that becomes part of that poem at the end. Um, so I don't know if that directly answers your, or it speaks to a little bit to your comment, but I'm, I'm fascinated by, um, by these shapes and absences of shapes. Any other comments or questions? I want to write a poem like that Herbert poem. I mean, it's just like you look at it and you just see these endless possibilities of these things that just keep appearing. And it just, you know, Helen Vendler, I, who I think is a fantastic critic, wrote a book on Herbert, but she calls that first stanza unremarkable. <laughs> uh, of, of, and 
I'm, it just kind of blows my mind that she doesn't think much of it. I'm just going to say, well, she was just a young pup of a critic at the time, um, you know, and, and uh, clearly missed amazing stuff that's going on. So. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>